Yes. Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we finished Judges chapter five yesterday, and we are about to enter into Judges chapter six, it may be best for us to do a small overview to begin today's study and to look at different points that are presented to us through the spirit of prophecy, as well as through scripture. Shall we seek the Lord's guidance as we open his word? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the night's rest that is now past. We thank you, Father, for the day that is ahead of us. As we enter into this study, we ask for your direction, for your blessing, for your guidance. May your spirit be with us, for we need the Holy Spirit to truly scripture. May your angels attend us, for we need protection from that of the adversary. We need your blessing in all things. There are many things that are going on within our lives, Father. Requests for healing, requests for protection, requests for guidance. Be with us now. Be with us each one now. Help us so that that which we do will be a blessing to others so that we may find that which you would have us to deal with. Direct us now. May our minds be open to your leadership. For this we thank you. For this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Now, as, as this study was being considered, there are many points within Judges chapter 6 that we're going to need to look at, and we're going to have to look at very differently from what we have done in the past. So in consideration for this, I was looking at one article that Mrs. White had written that you will find Signs of the Times, 23rd of June, 1881. Now, while it's entitled Gideon Called, this does give us a, a fair overview of what we're going to be looking at within this chapter of the Bible. So, alas, in that history of God's chosen people, the sorrowful story of apostasy and its punishment must so oft be repeated. Forty years of peace elapsed after the destruction of Sisera and his host. And again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. Heretofore, the hand of the oppressor had fallen but lightly on the tribes dwelling east of the Jordan, but in the present calamities, they were the chief sufferers. <coughs> Excuse me. So, when we're speaking of the tribes to the east of the Jordan, who are we talking about? We were just talking in, in, the, in the group conversation before the study, we were talking about one of those tribes, Reuben. Reuben, yeah, and you have Gad. And we have Gad, and we have Manasseh, the half tribe of Manasseh. So Manasseh being the half tribe, but we have Manasseh to the east, and we have Manasseh to the west, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, 
the Midianites and the Amalekites who dwelt on the eastern borders of the land and in the deserts beyond were still the bitter and unrelenting enemies of Israel. These nations had been well nigh destroyed by the Israelites in the days of Moses, but they had since increased greatly and had now become a numerous and powerful people. They had thirsted for revenge, and now the opportunity had come. What revenge are we talking about? Well, this was the revenge regarding... Um... Um, oh, can't think think of it. Um, this was the last act that was commanded of Moses because of the apostasy at Baal Peor. Right. So yeah. So it's Baal Peor, and um. So now you got the Amalekites, they're going to be destroyed 400 years later. After Moses, 400 years after Moses. In this situation, after Baal Peor, we find a party, a singular party that chose to join with the Midianites. We find Balak, the, the, the prophet who was called for gain, whose donkey crushed his foot, fell down in front of the Lord, and had turned out into the field. Yeah, so Balaam. Balaam, excuse me. And so Balaam had joined with the Midianites, thinking that his future was going to be separate from that after he had blessed so richly the children of Israel. In the battle that ensued, Balaam and many of the Midianites were killed. This was a battle where the children of Israel were told to destroy the Midianites. But what did they do? They let the women and children live. So um, where was it? What, what are you referring to? I'm referring to what had, what the last battles that, that had been directed by God to Moses in the destruction of the Midianites. Okay, so I don't remember that, but. Uh... Okay, just a moment. I'll see if I can pull it back up. Okay. Yeah, and also I don't think that Balaam was killed. I thought you said Balaam was killed. Okay, if we if we took a look at um, Signs of the Times, 6th of January, 1881. Yeah. I'll read you part of that since I can't bring it up on this screen. Okay. Moses' work for Israel was almost done, yet one more act remained for the aged leader to perform ere he should go to his long rest. Avenge the children of Israel of the Midianites was the divine command. Afterward, thou shalt be gathered unto thy people. This mandate was communicated to Israel, not as the word of Moses, but of Christ, their invisible leader. And it was immediately obeyed. 1,000 men were selected from each of the tribes of Israel and sent out against the Midianites. In the battles that followed, the people were defeated with great slaughter. The men who promptly and speedily executed the divine judgments upon those heathen nations 
have been pronounced harsh and unmerciful in destroying so many human lives. But all who reason thus fail to understand the character and dealings of God in his infinite mercy. The, long, the Lord had long spared those idolatrous nations, giving them evidence upon evidence that he, the mighty Jehovah, was the God whom they should serve. He had commanded Moses not to make war upon Moab or Midian, for their cup of iniquity was not yet full. Additional evidence was to be given. Clear and distinct light from the throne of God itself was to shine upon them. When the king of Moab had called Balaam to pronounce a curse upon Israel and thus accomplish their destruction, the goodness and mercy of God was strikingly displayed. That corrupt and hypocritical gain seeker whose heart longed to curse God's people for reward, was constrained to pronounce upon them the richest and most sublime blessings. The Moabites themselves could see that it was the power of God which controlled the avaricious prophet and compelled him in the most exalted strains of inspiration to proclaim Israel, God's chosen, and his almighty power, her protection. Here, the last ray of light shone upon a stiff-necked people who had set their wills in defiance to the will of God. When, at the suggestion of Balaam, the snare was laid for Israel, halted in the destruction of many thousands, then it was that the Midianites measure of their iniquities. Then their day of probation, the door of mercy was, went forth from him who can create and can destroy, vex the Midianites and smite them, for they vex you with their wiles. Those who would complain of God or question the wisdom and justice of his dealings with his creatures should realize their own incompetence with their finite wisdom to determine what conduct is befitting to judge of all the earth. They should make it their chief anxiety to so conduct themselves as not to become subjects of his wrath and should leave the Lord to deal with the work of his hands according to his own wise purposes. Moses had been filled with grief and indignation at the deceitful wiles by which Israel had been enticed to sin and thus bring upon themselves the wrath of God. In the command to make war upon the Midianites, Moses saw not only the justice of God in visiting his judgments upon the guilty, but his mercy in giving Israel the victory over a people who were seeking by every hellish art to accomplish their destruction. The Israelites were to engage in this warfare, not to gratify malice or revenge, but as God's instruments to, to do his bidding, being influenced solely by zeal for the divine glory. God's method of dealing with sin is not in harmony with the views enshrined by a large class who occupy a prominent position among the professed followers of Christ. Many of these men cherish sin and laud the benevolence and long suffering of God and dwell upon the loving character of Jesus, all mercy, all tenderness, while they pass over the threatenings of God's wrath against sin and sinners, and our Savior's scathing denunciation of hypocrisy and self-deception, it is those who have not a keen sense of the exceeding sinfulness of sin that are ready to question the justice of God in punishing such, with such severity the sins of the Amalekites, the Canaanites, and the Midianites. Those who love sin are unable to comprehend God's dealings with his subjects. Now there's, there's quite a bit more within this. Now I'm gonna skip a couple of paragraphs. Balaam, having yielded himself to the control of covetousness, and hardened his heart by persistent rebellion, had joined his fortunes with the Midianites, and he perished in the general slaughter. Oh, okay. Had he, he had felt a presentment that his own end was near, 
when he exclaimed, let me die the death of the righteous and let my last end be like this. The fate of Balaam is similar to that of Judas and their characters bear a marked resemblance to each other. Both had received great light and enjoyed special privileges, but a single cherished sin like gangrene poisoned the entire character and drove them to perdition. While the victorious Israelites completely destroyed the armies of Midian, they spared all the women and the children and brought them into the camp as captives. When Moses ascertained this, he became alarmed and indignant and thus reproved the officers of the host. Behold, they caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor, and there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. There had been a lack of thoroughness in executing the commands of God. The war against Midian had been a just retribution upon a guilty people, of whom the women had been the principal criminals. Had these idolatrous, licentious women been preserved as captives, their presence would have constantly endangered the morals of Israel. The sympathy which would spare these transgressors was contrary to the will of God. In this situation, <clears throat> those that remained of the Midianites, those that had not been destroyed as Christ himself had directed, led to a people that revenge and now the opportunity for that revenge had come. Do we have any question about what was just read? Do we have any comment? I'm not trying to stop comments. I want comments. Well, one of the um, disputes I had a while back, I think was in a Thursday night prayer meeting when we were talking about whether sometime in this era, in these end times, we would be required to take up arms against God's foes. And I said, I am definitely not in favor of gun control or a weapons control. It's proven that in the hands of righteous people, whether they know God or not, they have moral principles where they are armed. The crime rate is way down. Uh, there are a few people on this land here, and I'm glad they have arms. And I have no fear whatsoever that they're going to misuse them. Uh, I am definitely in favor of having arms in the house. If you have a home invasion, I said to these people, this is where uh, the rub comes, isn't it? Are you going to stand there passively if an inv armed invader, an insane berserk invader comes into your home and wants to kill or rape your wife or kill or maim you and rob you? And they kid couldn't answer me. Now, I definitely do pray to the Lord for protection all the time. But I'm telling you, if you've got a firearm and you know how to use it and you have to use it, go ahead and use it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I would just trust in God's protection, but anyway. And that's the way that I would approach it as well. I mean, I know we have angels watching over us, and uh, they will protect us from... So, the my, my question, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go in a different manner altogether. What figuratively could we address from this passage that I just read specifically about Balaam? Well, I know that Ellen White wrote a lot about the, the, the dangers of being covetous. 
and storing up riches here on earth for the wrong purposes. I don't see anything wrong with being wealthy as long as it's used properly, right? For God's glory. Um, right now, I finally, I guess I'm trusted by the Lord to have all this wealth, but I'm handling it, but it's not in my, it doesn't belong to me. We're, I'm dispensing as much as possible to those in need. I mean, we, we're bringing loads to this thrift store. There are some things I am keeping unless the, the uh, rels of the person who is in charge of this says, give it up. Like I've got an, an antique things, for, for example, the uh, silver. I don't, I don't covet it. I figure if it's here, let's use it for God and in the person of those in need or give it to the relatives who could be the rightful claimants, right? So it doesn't bother me. I mean, we found coins and all kinds of things lying around. And we just say, well, we found this. And I, I did ask about selling some of the stuff that was left on this land. And we were told, if you can sell it, keep the money. So this is the way it's being handled here. And I really believe God is blessing us because of that. I'm just not saying, oh, well, let's sell this. It's probably worth $1,000 or more, you know? Like, I don't even know how much some, some of this stuff is worth. The land itself is probably worth millions. But it's, most of it is going to the SDA church, the mainstream. Okay. And, go ahead, please. Nope, you go ahead. Symbolically, we are given what Mrs. White has written about this with Balaam. Mm -hmm. His character is compared with that of Judas. Mm -hmm. Both had been given great light. Now, the situation that we're dealing with here, because Balaam had yielded, yielded himself to the control of covetousness, and had hardened his heart by persistent rebellion. He then joined his fortunes with the Midianites. And as Mrs. White wrote, the fate of Balaam is similar to that of Judas, and their characters bear marked resemblance to each other. Both received great light, and both enjoyed special privileges, but a single cherished sin like gangrene poisoned the entire character and drove them to their destruction symbolically Balaam was a Judas symbolically they both are representative of Parminder mm -hmm. However, the effect of Balaam was left in such a manner that the Midianites to whom he joined continued to ensnare and create issues for the children of Israel. The Midianites thirsted for revenge and now the opportunity had come. Because of their sins, the protecting hand of God was withdrawn from Israel, and they were left to the mercies of their enemies. The wild, fierce inhabitants of the deserts as grasshoppers for a multitude came swarming into the land with their flocks and herds and pitched their tents in plain and valley. They came as soon as the harvest began to ripen and remained until the last fruits of the earth had been gathered. They stripped the fields of their increase and robbed and maltreated the inhabitants and then returned to the deserts. Thus, the Israelites had been forced to abandon the open country and to congregate in the walled towns, <clears throat> and many had even found shelter in caves among 
the mountains. How like the children of Israel of this example are we today? Does this not represent the current condition of the movement? Mm -hmm. For seven years, this oppression continued. And then in their distress, the people remembered him who had so often delivered them. And they cried unto the Lord for help. But while they were very desirous to be relieved from their oppressors, they did not exercise true repentance for their sins. Was the children of Israel at that time experiencing the 2520? Yes. And as Ellen White says, well, she's talking about Deuteronomy 28, but she connects Deuteronomy 28 with Leviticus 26. Yes. And she says it received a partial fulfillment in the peer, in the time of the judges, but a more complete fulfillment in the captivity of Israel in Assyria and Judah in Babylon. Um, so the com the more complete fulfillment happened, what we call the seven times with literal Israel and also with, with uh, northern Israel, Judah and Israel. But here it's a partial fulfillment in the period of the judges. Well, this partial fulfillment was falling upon how many tribes? Well, in this case you're talking about? Um, yes, I am tribes that are um, east of the Jordan. So that'd be the half tribe of Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben. So it's falling upon how many tribes? Three. Okay. So this 2520 is falling upon 25% of the tribes. Mm -hmm. Were there not four 2520s? Yeah. So here in this situation, we have those that are dwelling to the east of the Jordan that for seven years, they are now under the hands of the Midianite oppressors. God could not help them in their state of impiety, but through his prophet, he addressed them in words of warning and reproof, and the message was publicly proclaimed from city to city throughout the land. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drave them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But ye have not obeyed my voice. We might expect the Israelites to harden their hearts against the reproofs of the prophet. <clears throat> we listen to hear them respond. We do not wish to be continually reminded of our sins. Speak to us words of peace, <clears throat> words of encouragement, words of hope. But do not keep ever before us the dismal relation of our backslidings. How often do the professed people of God at the present day turn away from instruction and neglect oft-repeated warnings? They dislike to be reminded of their defects of character. They are unwilling to be reproved for their pride and idolatry and turning from the requirements of God to seek the gains, the friendship, or the pleasures of the world.
What kind of a warning are we seeing here for us today? How can we apply this within the movement at this time? Well, we need to accept reproof. Yes, we do. Amen. Such was the manner in which some of the Israelites received the message of reproof. Had the people been enjoying prosperity, this feeling of rebellion would, no doubt, have been general. But in their distress from the oppression of their enemies, with want and even starvation staring them in the face, they felt their need of help from God. They knew that unless he who they had so dishonored should manifest his power for their deliverance, they must perish. In deep humility, they accepted the message of reproof, confessed their sins, and implored the mercy of the Most High. Are we not today within the movement experiencing both want and starvation of the word of God. And if we are not willing to accept our need of his guidance, will we not survive? Will we now starve for the lack of the word? We are facing a time of preparation unlike any other in this world's history. Yet are we prepared to be able to give the message of final warning? We're being prepared. Some of us are. Right now, <clears throat> The movement is not unified, but the, the movement is being prepared to be unified. In unity, there is strength. There will be those that will not wish to be unified. It is to their detriment. Amen. Now, we've now read through paragraph number seven. We'll go to a new share. As we open Judges chapter six. We have different divisions of this chapter. The Israelites, for their sin, are oppressed by Midian. They cry to God. A prophet is sent to reprove them. An angel sendeth Gideon to deliver them. Gideon asketh a sign. He bringeth flesh, broth, and bread to the angel, which are all miraculously consumed by fire. Gideon destroyeth Baal's altar and grove, and sacrificeth upon an altar which he built unto the Lord. The men of his city require him to be put to death. His father defendeth him and giveth him the name of Jerubbaal. Gideon gathered an army to fight the Midianites, the double sign granted according to his prayer. The first verse that we read, and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. At this point, we are seeing in a figurative manner. 
that the movement has done evil in the sight of the Lord and that the hand of Midian, the hand of those that Balaam had joined himself to, the people that should have been destroyed are now the oppressors. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, and because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. So it wasn't just that Midian prevailed against Israel. Midian was strong against Israel. Now, as we continue, and so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them. What is being represented here by the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east? We've referred to this several times in our studies. Do we not have a threefold power here? Mm -hmm. Do we not have the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet? Would the children of the east be the dragon, the Amalekites be the beast, and the Midianites represent the false prophet? <clears throat> okay, so you're going to have which being which? The dragon being the children of the east, the beast being the Amalekites, and the false prophet being the Midianites. Okay. Um, why would you choose those different ones for the different symbols? Who had joined themselves to the Midianites? Well, you have um, let me think here. Well, Did not Balaam join himself to the Midianites? Okay. Yeah, okay. So Balaam is going to be joined to the, the Midianites. Was not Balaam a false prophet? Mm -hmm. Therefore, can the symbol of the Midianites also represent the false prophet? Well, I guess so. I just don't see it. Um, okay, what about Amalek? I'm looking at Amalek being the beast because when the children of the east were dealing with, with a group that is more in the background, more hidden. Hmm. We have applied those that are hidden in the background to being more that of the dragon. I mean, in the, in the story of Elijah, wasn't Jezebel more in the background than in the forefront? Yeah, it's just here, the children of the East, who would these be referring to specifically? Well, since we have the Midianites and the Amalekites identified, 
wouldn't the children of the east have been other of the tribes that had inherited, I mean, that area more like the sons of Ishmael? Yeah, well, that's what I would think. So, I, you know, I can see there's a threefold enemy. I just don't know if you could apply it to the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. I mean, it's symbolically a threefold enemy. Um, why are you trying to get the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet here? As we look at this situation, I'm asking if this can be applied to us today. Right. So I don't see why we would have the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet here. Because we're talking about this movement, right? Symbolically, yes. Okay. So. so the threefold enemy would have to be something else other than the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Then what would it be? I don't know, because we have to figure out when this is exactly what what history in this movement this is illustrating because these are going to be those that are oppressing uh this movement that have been allowed to continue so i don't know if this is going back to the beginning of this movement or to the end of it i'm asking if it's not more toward the end of it Well, when you have a false prophet that has, has touched the situation, and as, as I was offering before, mm -hmm. symbolically, is Parminder symbolically like Balaam? Yeah. But that's going to be the rebellion of Baal Peor, and this isn't. I'm aware of that. Right. So I'm just trying to figure out where we're going to place this, because looking ahead and the call of Gideon and, and how we've applied it, I mean, in the past, I, so I don't think that we're looking at Parminder's uh, error here as the one that's oppressing us these seven years. Okay. The problem that, that – that were, was presented as we were going through this in Judges 4 and 5. Mm -hmm. We have those within the movement that had been touched by the errors of Parmender. Mm -hmm. What we've read from the Spirit of Prophecy and what we're seeing here, the Midianites have become a very strong people again, even though this should not have been the case that the leaders of Israel under the direction of Moses had been told to destroy Midian. They destroyed the armies, but what did they leave alive? Well, women and children. The women are representative of? Church. So my question to you right now since Balaam had infected the church, since Balaam had infected the movement, is it possible that the Midianites are representing those that have opposed the message of chronology? I don't think that that's what this is talking about. In judges. So I don't think this is addressing Parminder or or the issues that we've already looked at. This is something else. Okay. So I'm not sure what it is, but um Hmm. 
then what we're going to <clears throat> what we're going to have here is a need for consideration and thought as to how these elements can be symbolically applied. Yeah. So what I think that this is referring so so Parminder, you know, personally he he leaves um, you know, November 9th would mark that separation from Parminder's group. Now we know that we do have uh, December 6, 2020 um, as well, but um, I still think that this refers more to uh, the period after, and this is something dealing with, uh, because this has to do with, okay, so if we look at Gideon, the whole idea of this story is that this is a whittling away uh, to to have the 300, right? All right. So you're going from this larger number to this smaller number. And and we try to apply the 300 then to those that were giving the July 18th proclamation. I mean, we had the symbol of the fleece, fleece and all these different things that we had applied. Um, and I don't think that that's, that's incorrect. Um, except that I think that this is continuing. So this is this is different, and, and I need to figure out what it is, but I just don't think it has anything to do with Parminder's movement. It has to do with, uh, and, and there's a lot of different symbols here that don't really relate to Parminder and what we saw in the other studies. Um, but as we went through those studies, we were not, as specifically direct as we have been so far in the balance of the book of judges yeah well i'm just saying that this deals with the july 18th proclamation and and um see the way that we had placed that on those lines when we had gone through the history of this movement is we had parminder of course i mean his his message still spans into our time right but I don't think this is addressing that. I think this is addressing the proclamation of July 18th itself. Because when we looked through this before, that's what we saw. And I don't think it's going to be different in that sense. But um, this oppression then would be an oppression that's occurring during this time of the July 18th proclamation. But it's not Parminder's oppression. It's some other oppression. All right. Because we have a whole bunch of symbols here. We have the dream of Gideon. Um, Which we're we, not even at yet. Yeah, I know. And then we have the fleece. And we have the blowing of the trumpet, and we have the picture, all these different symbols, and, and they have to apply to July 18th prediction. So, yeah, I know we're not there yet, but I'm just saying that based upon everything I see here, this oppression is something else. And that's what we never addressed before, what the actual oppression was, in the sense that we saw it was July 18th, but we never thought what is what are the Midianites symbolizing in those this oppression. Okay. And and I don't think that you can take this as the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, because they're not oppressing this movement. Now maybe in some kind of bigger application of this, you could, but but even then I don't know. That I would ever take the children of East to be other anything other than Islam. Okay, but that's just my thoughts on this as as I'm thinking about it. But we we have a lot to address here yet. Mm -hmm. And they encamped against them, and destroyed the increase of the earth, till thou come unto Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. 
And the alternate reading says neither goat, nor ox, nor ass. These three further symbols mm -hmm. are being removed. The sheep and the goat both relate to the sanctuary. So do the ox. Does the ass relate to the sanctuary in any regard? No. But the I ass. I remember reading that. Sorry, Dwight. I remember reading that the ass and ass was to have its neck broken. Okay, now when would that be? I don't recall it, but I'm sure if, if somebody wanted to bring an, bring an ass to the sanctuary as, as a sacrifice, it were better to break its neck than to do that. I yeah. Mean, an unclean, considered yeah. unclean or bad. Yeah, so it's not related to any offering in the sanctuary. Now, in Judges 6.4, The translators gave several verses that they used to support this portion of destroyed the increase of the earth. It's interesting to me that Judges 6 verse 4, if you reverse the numbers, you again have the symbol of 46. Okay, so Exodus 13, 13. Okay. And every firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with the lamb, right? So this is dealing with the firstborn, right? So all the animals, right? Verse 12 says, thou shalt set apart unto the Lord all that openeth the matrix, and every firstling that cometh of a beast which thou hast, the male shall be the Lord's. And every firstling of an ass shalt thou redeem with a lamb. And if thou wilt not redeem it, then thou shalt break his neck, and all the firstborn of man among children shall be he redeemed. So it's just saying, if you're not going to redeem the ass, you need to actually kill it. So, so you need to bring a lamb if you're going to keep that animal. That's what what uh, Angela is referring to. Okay. So the ass can be redeemed by the sacrifice of a lamb and a lamb of course is a sheep or a goat a lamb can refer to the lamb of the sheep or the lamb of the goat okay yeah and, and it's also in exodus 34 20 as well the, basically the same id idea okay but the verses that were being presented under the destruction of the increase of the earth would take us first to Leviticus 26, 16. Here again, I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, and the burning og that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of the heart, and ye shall sorrow your seed in vain, you shall sow your seed in vain, but your enemies shall eat it. Deuteronomy 28 is a little more direct. Thou shalt betroth the wife, and another man shall lie with her. Thou shalt build an house, and thou shalt not dwell therein. Thou shalt plant a vineyard, and shall not gather the grapes thereof. The fruit of thy land, and all thy labors, shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up. And thou shalt be only oppressed and crushed alway. And he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle and the fruit of thy land until thou be destroyed, which also shall not leave thee either corn, wine, or oil, or the increase of thy kind, or flocks of thy sheep, until he hath destroyed thee. Finally, they presented Micah 6.15. Thou shalt sow, but thou shalt not reap. Thou shalt tread the olives, but thou shalt not anoint thee with oil and sweet wine. 
but shalt not drink wine. All of this situation ties right back to what you were saying to begin with. This ties back to Leviticus 25 and 26, the blessings and the curses for disobedience, and the expansion that we find in Deuteronomy 28. Now, all of this is being presented along with this in Judges 6-4. So the Midianites literally fulfilled the blessing and the curses with this portion of Israel. The symbols here need yet to be addressed. But in the following verse, for they came up with their cattle and their hurt and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude, for both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. At this point, haven't the messages within the movement been looked to be destroyed by others. Okay, so you have a symbol here, grasshoppers. Right. You had another symbol, children of the east. Yes. Uh, you have another symbol, an ass. All of these point to Islam. I'm not disagreeing. Mm -hmm. So how do we relate this to what we're studying right now? Well, I would say that this, I mean, because our understanding of this in the past is Gideon is going to refer to Jeff, his message. But it's going to be whittled down, right? And his message is going to be about Islam. So I don't think we would change this. I still think that applies. Now, we could say um, that these represent different aspects of our message, because we do have the aspect of Islam. Now, what would the message, what would the ox symbolize as part of our message? Since both the ox and the sheep are part of the sanctuary, mm -hmm. we'd have to ask where the interrelation is going to come with what this message is all about. Okay, so we have the sheep, we have the ox, Right, so we know that those are sanctuary animals. Ass is not, and it, it represents Islam. Can we make a distinction between sheep and ox as different parts of our message? I think that's something we're going to have to consider. Yeah. Well, isn't there a tribe that had an ox as, as, as its symbol? Or an ox's head or something? So you're asking is what tribe had the ox as the symbol? Yeah, I'm just inquiring because I thought I'd read that somewhere or heard it somewhere. Okay, yeah. now, is there a tribe also that has the sheep as a symbol? No. Not that I can remember. I don't remember that. Um, but the ox, wouldn't that be Ephraim? I think so. I don't remember, unfortunately. But what if these three represent three parts of our message? The message of Islam, uh, the sheep, we'd have to figure out which what this refers to, but 
um, if the ox is represented by Ephraim, that would be um, Protestantism, a message about Protestantism. Okay. Um, I mean, well, if we're, we're going to take three aspects of our message, I mean, normally we would look at, we have the message of the 2520, we have the message of Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, and we have the message of Islam, those three parts of our message. Okay, Ephraim is the ox. Issachar is a strong bone donkey. Okay, so right, right. Issachar is, is, is the donkey. Right. Uh, none for a sheep, though. There's no ram or anything. Is there? I'm looking. Yeah, I don't. I don't see anything for sheep. Okay. So it's interesting. We have two of two of these tribes that are represented by these neither are involved in this story. Mm -hmm. Technically, you could, yeah, what's that? Technically, you could make the case that Ephraim has a relationship in the story because it's the other half tribe. Yeah. But I would just think the symbols here would have to be parts of our message. And I don't, you know, so the message of the ox or the message of the sheep. I'd have to think about it a bit. <clears throat> but we do have the grasshoppers, we do have the ass, and we do have the children of the east, which are all symbols of Islam. Right. Now, these peoples <clears throat> entered into the land to destroy it. As they're entering into this land, they are entering into a message. They are entering into a message to make it of none effect. Would we have any problems with that application? Hmm. If we if we look at these situations, path of the just mm -hmm. joined with the message, but they did not wish to accept the method of study. They wanted to do it their own way. Parminder coveted the power, coveted the income. His covetousness is what led to the need to separate because he was not keeping the the word of the Lord as it had been given through Father Miller. This wasn't his his way of doing things. He wanted to change things. And what about Mark Bruce? Thinking about him as well. Because how did Mark Bruce come into this message? Well, I, I mean, like, what were the steps? Because he was into um, conspiracy theories, which he saw with, um, uh, what's his name? A guy from South Africa who lives in Vancouver now. Uh, Walter Veith. 
He lives in Vancouver. I think so. Maybe not. Well, he has a ministry in Vancouver. Right. He's got a ministry there, but I don't think he lives there. Okay. I don't know where he lives then. I believe he's still in South Africa. Oh, really? I could be wrong. I've been wrong before. I was thinking that Mark Bruce was brought in by Emiliano. Oh? I don't think so. I believe I that's I believe that's what Jeff said. Okay, so maybe he contacted with Emiliano's ministry and came in? Right. Okay. But I know at first he when he told me a story, he didn't mention Emiliano at all. Um you know, he just said that he found out about Future for America um, through first understanding conspiracy theories and then ran across some videos or something. But it could have been Emiliano's videos. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know enough about, about that story. Okay. But I know he went to the School of the Prophets. That's when, once he found out about this movement, he went down there. Okay. Now, and Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. The next verse, and it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a man, a prophet, unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. We are not told who this prophet was. We are told that this was a man, a prophet, that was sent unto the children of Israel. Yeah, so this would be a message. This is a message, definitely. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and have drave them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, that ye have not obeyed my voice. This is a message calling people to repentance. It's not doom and gloom. It's basically saying, separate yourself from your own desires, from your own way of doing things. Obey my voice. How else can we look at this in a symbolic manner? What else do we see here? Well, it really stands. To me, besides the fact that God wants us to be mindful of all the ways he's led us and blessed us, he says, fear not the gods of, of the Amorites. There's a lot of idols around and we're not to be fearing or falling down before them. Uh, what is the sin in our lives? What is the, <clears throat> the training in our lives that we need to get rid of? We need to abandon them, this focus on God.
Any other thought or comment? What else do we see here? Um, well, I don't see I don't see it clearly yet what it what it is we're looking at. Okay. What we have in this portion of this chapter, in these 10 verses. We have a people that had enjoyed prosperity for 40 years. The prosperity has now gone away. We have oppression that has come for seven years. For symbolically 2,520 days. one-fourth of the warning of Leviticus 26. How are we to look upon this? How are we to address this? We have many symbols within these 10 verses that we're going to need to clarify so that we can then go on to the rest of this chapter. In order to be able to clarify this, we're going to have to be able to identify what the symbol of the Midianites mean to us, what the symbol of the Amalekites mean to us, what the symbol of the children of the East are. We're, we're presenting one potential symbol in the children of the East being Islam, the children of the East being the ass. Okay, so when we look at this movement, because we're trying to apply this to enemies that weren't destroyed that affect this movement. Right. And so we have these errors, you know, we had Parminder's error and we had Mark Bruce's error and, and of course, pass of the just and so forth. But there's another element that has existed within this movement that hadn't been connected with any of those. And that would be the element that's connected with the Adventist church itself. That is, we have a number of people in this movement who are still, their loyalties lie with the Adventist church. And um, that is, they haven't full heartedly embraced the message of this movement. Now, it doesn't mean that they're you know, totally supportive of the church or anything. But it would be a message um, that, that I see a tendency at times of some people that um, they're going to be trying to convert the church they're, instead of individuals, if you understand what I'm saying. There's a difference between ministering to individuals within the church but trying to, to get the church to accept this message, whether that's the local church that they attend or whether it's you know their pastor or whether it's their conference or whether they, they believe that the whole church needs to accept this message. And I don't see that our, our, that our, that this is a work of reform that comes internally within uh, each person, not something that's going to be, you know, we don't need. And, and when I say the church, I, I can talk about people like uh, Walter Weith and um, 
uh, Doug Batchelor and these a lot of these evangelists and so forth that people look up to and that they watch. And, and they can even be ones that we would look at as, as quite opposed to the church. Um, like, uh, uh, what's the name of that ministry? Um, S- Save to Serve. And so people are looking for these big people, these large organizations or whatever they are, that somebody is going to have to accept this message. And, and I see often that they're affected or infected by the messages that these people are giving. Um, so I don't think we've addressed that yet as far as the enemies. Does that make any sense to anyone? You're giving. Yes, it does. Just because, sorry, just because somebody is against the church does not mean that that person is pro us. Yeah, well, and, and when we look at the other enemies, the Philistines, are they descendants of Abraham? Are they relatives? Or the Canaanites? No. But aren't the Amalekites and the Midianites related to us and and also the children of the East related? Yes, they are. Right. So this is a different type of enemy than the Canaanites or um you know, these other these other enemies that we saw already. Any thoughts on that, Dwight? I'm considering it. I mean, so much of this, so many of these symbols can be related to those that have taken in just part of either the message of reliant upon man's wisdom, such as we've seen within the Protestant churches, or those that are reliant upon the aberrant portion of the message that was being given by Parminder and by several others. We have a movement that has had elements from all of these messages that need to be purged out. And I'm not saying this to be unkind, but how much of this, of these reliances that these others have had have infected the movement and the way in which things are, are proceeding well yes and so you'll have these people and they can even be opposed to the church in, right in some way. <clears throat> say the church is an apostasy or whatever um but part of why they um don't fully accept the message let's put it that way and why they end up becoming enemies of the message right has to do with uh, their view of the church, that is their their relationship with the church in some way, that they're going to either save the church. Um, and some of these go back to the church, right? So when they leave the movement for whatever stage along the way, uh, they're going to go back to the church, right? And they're going to just regularly attend Adventist churches, even though they may believe some aspects of our message, some of them reject the message entirely and just go right. to, go back to being regular Adventists. So, so there's something here about that. And, and when we look at all the different enemies, so, so far, when we look at the judges, um, 
you know, we had Othniel. He's going to be raised up because they're serving uh, uh, the gods of, of the land, right? Right. And then you're going to have um, Ehud. And this is the king of Moab, right? So, I mean, the Moabites are related. So we can't say that none of these were related before. But how are the Moabites related? How, how did that come about? Literally? Yeah, literally. Moab being one of uh, Lot's sons, isn't it? Right. Yeah, so that's going to go back to uh, the time of Noah. That That's an earlier separation. No, time of Abraham. Abraham, right, Abraham, pardon me. Uh, Abraham, I don't know what I was thinking. I, I was thinking of something else. Okay, so Abraham. So this is going to be Lot, so it's not... It's not a descendant of Abraham. Right. But okay. it's it's still a relative of Abraham. Yeah, relative, but not a descendant. Okay. And then you have, um, and then finally you have the Philistines with Shamgar. And then you're going to have the kings of Canaan in dealing with uh, chapter four and five. And so now you're going to have Midian and Amalek. Right. And those are descended through how, – how did those descendants come Midian about? Midian is – isn't that through Abraham? And Amalek is through Esau. Okay. So these are then uh, descendants of Abraham. Right. Okay. And okay. then you're going to have – after Gideon, you're going to have – well – this is going to be more internal as Abimelech's conspiracy, right? Okay. Um, and so then they're just going to go into apostasy, basically. And we have a lot more to consider here, and I think we're going to have to prepare this for tomorrow morning. Yeah. So I'm just saying, and, and, and then finally you're going to come around uh, to the Philistines again with Samson. Right. Okay. So and that's going to be the last of the judges. Okay. So there's something going on here anyway. Um Yeah, we have so quite a bit to consider. Yeah. So I just think that we need to we need to sort this out. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we will return to this tomorrow morning. Any other comments, any other thoughts at this time? Okay, shall we close with prayer? Loving Father, we see our great need of you in all of these examples. We do not wish to be of those that have apostatized from you. The example that we are beginning to study, where our forefathers, were for seven years under the hands of those that sought to do them harm is very telling. Help us today, Father. Guide us in all that you would have us to do. Prepare us so that we may come to a closer understanding and have a closer walk with you. May your will be done in our lives. For you are Lord. We need you in all ways and in all things. For this we thank you. For this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Recording stop.